Um, I've been at the university either teaching adjunct or on faculty for, let's see, about six years now. And um, one thing that I found, especially in the first little while, I was teaching both in person and um, over, um, we use Adobe Connect Classroom, so online. Um, and what I found is that in the traditional approach that I learned, where you have readings and assignments and then you come to class prepared and participate in a lecture and then to prepare you for some kind of application assignment that you complete post-class, that I wasn't engaging my students very well. So some of the issues I had was they just didn't complete the readings. There was not, unless I put in a quiz, which then they hated me for having a quiz at the beginning of class, um, they didn't do the readings. And even if I had the quiz, they didn't really absorb the content. They tried to scan for what is she going to ask instead of really learning the content. Um, and then they complained about the lectures. They said, you're going over everything in the readings, but they didn't do the readings. So I don't know why that was a problem for them, but it was. Um, and then it limited the time in our class discussion, and they weren't engaged enough to really dive into what we wanted to talk about because they hadn't prepared with the background information. Um, to be able to be successful in talking about the topics. So um, my department, we were doing a little shift in the way we were delivering some of our content. So we met with City, um, and they, with our others from my department, worked with us on redesigning our courses to be um, more accessible and amenable to the current student population that relies so heavily in their life on technology. Um, and so if you are interested in this, I would suggest that you connect with either their workshop or get together some colleagues and contact Travis Thurston and say, we want to do this. And he can help. They have all sorts of supports to help step you through the process of flipping or blending your classes. Um, one thing to think about when you are designing your course so that um, it's flipped, and flipped means they get the content before, and then in class is more of the hands-on experiential um, discussion kind of activities. Um, one thing they want to know is how much time is this going to cost me? Like, how much time is this going to take? Because previously, I would have, in my department, our courses are one, one day a week, and they're like two and a half to three hour long classes. So they want to know, like, if I'm spending this much time and we're only having class for an hour and a half now, and it's a five credit or a three credit course, um, why are you asking me to do all of this stuff? So I always give them a formula. I, you know, at the beginning of class, I say, you have a three credit course, which equates to nine to 12 hours of work a week. So that's what you need to anticipate and plan for. And that is just. I searched all over the internet and asked colleagues, like, what's the formula? Um, anyways, that's what I found. So the first thing I wanted to show you is kind of how I organized my courses. Um, so I went to City and had them help me make my template so that I could build off of that. Um, but I organize them in a way that's easy for them to find the information and know what my expectation is. Uh, let's come back to this one, too. Let's see if I can open the link. Or I'm just going to show it because it's easier for me. OK. So these are two different courses that I have. Um, this one is um, we only meet about every other week of the semester. Um, and most of their content is delivered asynchronous, and they do it at their own time, at their own pace. Um, and so I have that broken up into six modules, six units across the semester. Um, and they can go in, and they get all the information about what the expectations are, and what the activities, and how their competency is going to be evaluated within that unit. Um, this one we meet every week. Um, except for the first week of the semester. Um, with that Monday holiday every year, there's a Monday holiday the first week of the semester. You have a one-day class. It messes things up. So um, 
I have instructions for them in that first week of what the expectation is for the course um, and the time that they should plan on um, completing, putting forth to complete the course um, each week. And then I go into um, the topic and the readings, the activities, and the evaluation. Um, if you haven't used an undergraduate teaching fellow in your department um, and your college supports those, I use my undergraduate teaching fellow to help me design and update my courses constantly. They're such a good help for that. Um, one thing I have them do, because my estimation of time is different than a student's estimation of time, is I have my new UTF each year go through and time how long it takes them to complete the assignments that I have. Um, and then they add that time into Canvas for me, an estimation of the time that it should take to complete these um, activities prior to class. So that is how I have that set up. If anybody has questions along the way, you can shout out. And there's apparently a box I can throw to you to speak into. So if you have questions, let me know, or comments. Okay. So once I, I have my structure and I'm planning that week, that module for the week, um, or the couple weeks, the process I do is I create my lecture. I go through the lecture, the content that I want to deliver. Um, I usually just create that um, in PowerPoint. And then I use a tool called Nearpod um, that my department's invested in um, that integrates with Canvas really nicely. and um, to put those into an online format. Um, in that, I include interactive tasks in the lecture, things that they need to respond to so that I know they're engaged. Because you can have, like, um, your Canvas, you can see how long they're engaged in certain pages, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they are actively engaged in those pages. So I always embed these interactive tasks into the lecture. Um, and then they also are linked back to the reading. And I'll put the pages of in the sections that I want them to reference back to so that I know they're also going to the readings and getting that information instead of just me reverberating it in, in the lecture. Um, and then I give them an estimated time. I try to break them into where maybe I would have lectured for an hour and a half. I break them into 15, 20, 30 minute chunks. However, the content breaks easily so that they don't have to do it all at once. Because what I found the first year when I had it at like the hour long lecture um, is that they would go back into it like three or four times. And I'll show you, um, I think I can show you how in, in SpeedGrader you can look at the Nearpods, um, their responses, but it just messed all of that up. So then I broke it into smaller chunks and they can do one in between a class and one in between um, dinner and their movie or whatever they're doing with their time. So um, I'll show you Nearpod, which I really like. Um, one thing with Nearpod is that there's some accessibility issues currently in using this format. Um, and so it doesn't allow closed captioning for the audio that you can add to it. So Chris Phillips um, is working with Nearpod to see if we can resolve that to make it more accessible for all students. Um, but so my process is I create my PowerPoint and I make sure to add in slides to prompt myself to add questions or um, discussion points or the, all the interactive things that are included. And then I upload it to Nearpod. I add in the activities. I go through and narrate it and I save it and then I can create it in Canvas. So, oops, oh, I forgot to log into this one before. Hopefully I can remember my password. Okay, Nearpod has free features and it was created for K-12. Um, but they're trying to branch more into higher ed. That one is not my password. Let's try my other one. Okay, um, and so as they branch into higher ed, they should become more accessible for our students. So here's an example of one that I created, um, I'm gonna just come in, let's actually go back 
to a different one so I don't mess up a current class that I already created for this year. Okay. So you just go in to edit. You create one on this, that first little spot you can create. And you just upload your slides. Um, and then you go in and it turns them into just an image. So you can't go in and edit them after. Um, but um, I just create a new slide image and then upload those if I have to replace content. Um, but some of the things that it has in there is it has web content. So you can connect to a website. This is a website that my students created for one of their projects. Um, and so I just put that right into the lecture for them to access. You can um, link to videos um, that are on YouTube or you can upload your own videos. Um, you can also search for others through your other ways to save and upload, Google Drive, Box, and all those things. Um, this one is, you can, I have a slideshow of PDFs. So if there's a bunch of materials you want to put together um, for them to go through, you can do that. And um, it has other things that I don't use in my world of special education, too. I'll click here. Um, so it has all of those things, slides, 3D images, simulations, um, calculators, PDF viewers, Twitter feeds web content, and then the activities. These are the interactive ones. Um, this time to climb thing, I have no idea what that is because it's new. Can you guys see the drop down box? Oh yeah. Um, open ended questions I use a lot to check their engagement with the material. Um, and then there are quizzes that where there's multiple choice. So if there's something that I need them to just spit back out to me, um, I'll use that feature. Um, you can have them draw on something if you want them to attend to certain features. Um, the collaboration, I use a lot too. Um, you create this collaboration board where once somebody goes in and completes the module asynchronously, um, they put their comment on there and then the next person puts their comment and they can build off of each other even though they're completing it asynchronous. Um, and then when we're in class together, I'll pull those into my, um, our live discussion to talk about the different perspectives that were shared. So, that one's a really cool thing, too. Um, okay, what, what am I on time? Let's see. I, okay. So does anybody have questions about that? And if you do, you can come ask me afterwards um, if you have, like, very specific questions. Okay. Okay, so once I create the Nearpods, I put them into an assignment. You can either like have it have them go to the Nearpod website, or you can integrate it with Canvas. Um, and I have found that integrating it with Canvas, they access it a lot more smoothly. Um, but you can also you can do those student paced, those asynchronous ones, or you can do a live lecture if you want everybody engaged in the content at the same minute of the day. Um, you can have it as a live lecture where you're navigating through from wherever you're at, whether you're in the front of the room or um, at your computer and they're at theirs. Um, and you can have it through Canvas or on Nearpod. Um, and then, let's see, <coughs> if I come back here. So here is um, an example of one on my page. You come here, and this is what it looks like. They add in their name if they haven't done it before. If they have, it saves their name, and you just go through. Um, one feature that I really like to, for Nearpod is that, that I hate hearing my voice, but you can narrate it. For some reason, the audio is blipping, but it usually just plays my audio. And the students can go through and listen to it. So I don't, I don't narrate every single slide. So that's the web content one. Um, but just the slides where I want to elaborate on the information. So, and that takes care of when students are like, all you do is read your slides. Like, 
you can skip some of those that you would want them to attend to, right? <laughs> but instead of reading them. None of us do that anymore, I'm sure. That was just our professors. Okay. Okay. Um, oh, I was going to show you how to put that into Canvas because, let's see. So if I go to assignments and I create a new assignment, um, you just, where you go to what you, submission type, you pick an external tool and you find it and it's right there on the list, Nearpod. And then you go into your course files on Nearpod's website and add in your lecture that you want to add in. One thing I like for this versus, I think I've tried to use, um, is it Captura that we have access to as well? Um, I really like that you can embed in all of the materials that they need to access, like the PDFs and the websites and those things, and they link them directly to that. That's a feature that I really like that Nearpod has um, and why I prefer to use that one, as long as they can figure out the accessibility issues. Um, so, and then you, that's how you create the assignment. Let's see. Okay. So, they go through and they complete all of those lectures prior to class with the responses in there. And then I go into SpeedGrader. It allows me to see their responses. Um, and go through and check their um, understanding to check to see what, if they responded correctly to those multiple choice questions or those short answers. Um, and then I'm prepared to know what other information I need to share with them, what corrections I need to share with them, um, and how to guide our discussion in class. I know they're prepared more so than when they just show up and I have a pop quiz. Um, because those I can't really grade very quickly until after unless I do something like simple multiple choice and Canvas tells me. Um, so I find that this helps me be better prepared to lead discussions um, than I was previously. Um, it also gives me time to adjust if I am sharing PowerPoints and slides, adjust what, are what the information is that I'm sharing for the class. Um, and then I usually we have some kind of discussion around the content that they engaged in previous to class. And then we have a collaborative activity, something that's more application based. Okay. Um, some other features that I use um, to flip my classroom so that they have um, experience in the topic, in the content prior to our in-class time. Um, I use GoReact, which I'm actually going to present on with some colleagues at the very last session, um, with the bummer session. So hopefully you guys all stay for those sessions because it looks like there's some great content at that time. Um, and I use that for if I want them to, here I'll show you one of the assignments in this class. So this one where we only meet every other week, um, one of their application assignments is to um, present on a, this is an assessment course, teaching them how to deliver assessment and understand what assessment is. Um, and so I want them to um, share information with each other about assessment tools. So I have the instructions and then they come in here and, and do a presentation where they record themselves um, presenting information and upload it just right on here or they can upload the file to that. And so that assignment, they present the materials and they can do it asynchronous. They don't have to all be together. Um, and then there's an assignment to where they need to go in and review each other's. And this tool is really cool because you can go in and you can um, comment on each other so they're required to comment on everybody's videos so that I know that they've engaged with it. Um, so that's another tool that I use. Um, what time do we go to in this session? 11.50. 11.50. Awesome. 
Um, how did I do that? Okay, I'll create an assignment for that one too. Um, you just go to those external tools again and find, and it's one of the options. Right there, go React. <coughs> so. You sh I am not from city, so I don't know how to answer that exactly. But what I found that if it's on that list, usually city will help me figure it out. <laughs> it's supported by Canvas some way, and city will help me figure it out. Sometimes they, sometimes there's been issues with Canvas, um, the things being on the list that Canvas um, will allow, but they don't necessarily support in the same way. So then you, like I've had to call Go React a lot. And they tell me how to um, how to work with Canvas. Well, Nearpod so. said you needed to buy. So our department purchased it. Um, I know there's other departments in the university who have gone in on that contract. Um, so I don't know if that one is accessible to everyone. If you go into your course and go to that, you can see if it is or not. You can also purchase it um, separate. Uh, it's not going to let me be out of here. Let's see. Log out right there. Um, you can also purchase your own account there as well. Yes. Nice. Can you repeat that? It's h5p.org. H5P it has a free um, system that you can interact with Canvas and have all of those, uh, over 100 interactive activities. They're amazing. Good. I'll have to look at that one too. Um, OK. Let me come back to my slides to see where I was at. Okay. Okay. Um, I also use online discussions within Canvas, just the ones that are part of Canvas, um, to have them respond. And that's pretty a pretty traditional online course strategy. Um, but I do it within my live courses as well um, as part of flipping that. So have them discuss a topic before class that then we're going to participate in. Um, an application assignment on. Um, one that I found, I, in one of my courses, we talk about child abuse and neglect, and that one is a pretty sensitive subject for some students in my class because of um, personal experiences. And I found that I didn't want to um, pinpoint them out because they, unintentionally, because they became emotional or um, their personality might change if they have had a previous experience with something that's triggering within the activity that could stigmatize them or point them out. And so what I found with that kind of sensitive topic is as I flipped my class and I put learning about that content online, having an online discussion, it helped prepare those students better for our application assignment and kind of prep them for that activity that may be a little bit triggering to them, if that makes sense. So those kind of sensitive so subjects, it can be helpful to use that kind of flipped classroom approach. And um, one thing I learned at the ETE conference a few years ago um, is using video announcements too. So in my classroom, because there's information that I want them to gain that I don't want to spend the time in class to go over, um, let me see if I can go back to an old one because I don't have my announcements yet for this semester. So, oh, it doesn't have them there anymore. Okay, I don't know where they went. But I would create a video announcement um, that I would record myself giving the information um, because, and then I would also script it underneath 
so that they could either just read the information or listen to me um, so that they could access it in multiple ways. Um, and then I would send that video announcement out this week on Canvas, go to this page, um, and sometimes I would even show them and I'd record those with um, previously Panopto and now Kaltura. Or I would just, if I didn't have anything to show them online, I would just record it with my um, computer um, video recording system. Um, and then I really like this tool and I learned about this one um, from some participating in something at the library. Um, let's see, I think I put a link to it actually. Um, one thing that my students were not doing is um, learning like factual things they needed to learn about child development. So they needed to learn these factual things. Um, and they weren't doing that. They were reading but not really learning them. So I used this night lab um, tool to create time, have them create timelines. It uses Google Docs and to have them create this timeline activity. So for our class, um, I want them to learn like the steps in order of child development. So you could use it for history if you want them to learn about certain events, um, if you want them to learn like a process and steps of things, um, you can adapt it for that. Um, so they created these websites um, to help um, learn about child development and developmental steps. And then I, in class, um, assess them on their understanding of child development based on scenarios linked back to um, the steps that they saw within these, this website that they created. Um, so you just, to do this, it's so, so easy. You go to Night Labs, this website, timeline.nightlabs, labs, like night, like K-N-I-G-H-T, labs.com, um, and scroll down and it gives you the steps for doing it. Uh, it gives you a template for the Google spreadsheet. Let's see if I can get back to mine linked here. And then I just have this integrated into my Canvas assignment. So they click on this and come to this document. They put in all the information and then my UTF goes in and checks to make sure they formatted it right um, and publishes it on the Knight website. Let's see, control copy. You come over here. You put it right in here. And there's either your shareable link or your embed. And so I just embed it right into the assignment on Canvas, but you can also use a shareable link and it gives you a preview. And there's your cool product that your students have created and now can use as a reference um, to learn the topic and the sequence that they need to learn. So, um, okay. So, um, does anybody have any questions about anything or want further explanations that I can give you? Yes. I'm just curious as to what kind of a, an effect this has had on your conversation in class. Yes, I need to toss you the box. I forgot about that part. Thanks. Is this one? Okay. Yep. I'm curious. It's not on. I'm Is there curious. a different box? Try this box. <laughs> okay. Is this one on? No? Yeah? Yeah. Okay, it is. It is. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm curious to know how these tools have affected your classroom conversations. Yes, thanks. That is an excellent question. So, um, my students previously, um, they didn't want to be quizzed, they didn't want to hear me lecture. Um, I had lots of complaints that way. Um, and in my IDEA feedback, um, those were the things that I typically heard. And um, they also had, um, I also got a lot of feedback on like um, assignments weren't thoroughly explained. Although I had an explanation on Canvas and in class, I would tell them what the expectation was and step through it. 
Um, but I found that that feedback on my IDA surveys has changed, and I'm not getting as much, if she wouldn't lecture or um, as much of that comments and more, um, I feel like I was engaged during the discussions, um, I understood the assignments, um, because they could go back and reference back to those lectures. And I found that some students would go back in as they were doing assignments, they'd go back into those and reference back as well. Um, one thing that my students did ask for um, is not just to have the Nearpod, but to also include a PDF because some of them like to use OneNote to take their notes because they could search and reference their content easier that way. So I did provide um, the PDF, or not the PDF, the PowerPoint, the PowerPoint version of the content as well to them so that they could reference it multiple ways as well. But I did have students, I surveyed them regularly throughout as I flipped my classroom. One thing they really liked is less time sitting in class and more flexibility and more autonomy over their learning that they could do things when they had time to do it. Um, most of our students have jobs or a lot of our students have families, um, new families or older families that they're juggling and so they really appreciated the flexibility in learning the content as well. So, yes, do you want to throw it back there? If you can throw backwards. <laughs> <laughs> nice. This is strange. I've never used one of these. <laughs> um, did you find that you have to provide a lot of, I don't know, tutorials or support? So your question was, do I, did I have to provide a lot of support and tutorials for my students? Is this kind of a new interface for them? Um, when I taught through distance, it was our alternative teacher preparation program, and a lot of those were returning students, um, and they did need more support in learning how to use the technology. My on-campus classes are usually almost 100% um, 20-year-olds. <laughs> They did not need any support in learning how to use this content. Every once in a while, there was somebody who didn't know how to open a fillable PDF and save it, and they're like, I just filled the PDF, and now it's gone. Um, and so there were a few things like that, um, but mostly they, my students who have more experience with the technology, I haven't had to explain it, but I did create um, some Nearpods that would just teach them how to interact with it as well. And um, some of my activities, like that first go react activity, um, because I also use it in supervision, I have them record um, them in their practicum sites and upload them and then give them feedback that way on their performance and application. Um, and so that assignment kind of preps them for that so that they can work through the bugs in a less um, weighted way because you can go back and record yourself again and again where when you're like live with the child you can't recapture that so i do prep them by giving them scaffolded experiences with the technology that way so back in the back do you want to throw it to him so we can catch it good luck <laughs> on the microphone one other fun, a fun technology that you can use as an alternative to the Canvas discussions is Flipgrid, which was just bought by Microsoft.com and, and made free for educators. What Flipgrid does is you can ask a question and then your students respond by recording a video of themselves with their phone or their laptop or their tablet. And then Flipgrid puts a grid of the student videos online so you can watch each of your uh, peers answering the question in a video format. Awesome. Would you mind sharing with everybody your name and where to find you? Because this oh. is... If okay. you're in the College of Education, um, <laughs> he is so helpful. I'm Nathan Smith. I'm the, uh, I'm the person that runs the Adele and Dell Young Education Technology Center, which is the resource center on the main floor of the education building. 
there. It's an open access computer lab, K-12 curriculum library, NASA Regional Educator Resource Center, and kind of the tr curriculum uh, technology integration uh, is, is what I teach for our uh, pre-service teachers. Thank you. Yes, yes, and I, I was just gonna say, I did, I did visit with Nathan a few times to help me figure out what technology to use, and he has an excellent newsletter as well that he sends out.